Wow. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Okay. I am here to talk about challenging bullies for dummies. Now, what do I mean by that? Firstly, if you don't have a problem with a bully or an aggressive person, if you can handle that kind of thing and not be manipulated by people who do that kind of stuff, fair play to you. Well done. That's really, really good. I'm sure you have plenty of other flaws you can work on, like the rest of us, and keep on going until you die and try to be the best version of yourself that you can. But for a lot of people, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room who might feel this way, the idea of being threatened or intimidated on any level, whether it's in the street, in the workplace, by a probably soon-to-be ex-partner, or in any way, shape, or form, to stand up and call out that behavior and try to neutralize it, certainly not escalate it. It's terrifying. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Because we, as, as human beings, we don't move towards comfort or discomfort. We move away from awkwardness. It's just part of our self-preservation brain. See, bullying is a power play. And by that, it's an attempt by somebody to dominate another person. Now, why does somebody bully? Well, that's a big question, probably, for academic conferences and so forth. But the general line from psychology is that bullies are often weak. They've been traumatized. They were bullied themselves. They have uh, some kind of wound. So they have to try to make themselves really big and make other people feel small so they can feel good about themselves. So it's kind of like a psychological sickness, indeed. Now, some people might have been grown up and been brought up in an environment where they're told by the people that bring them up, you've got to be tough in this world. You've got to grab it and take it. It doesn't matter who you stand on. You have to do it. Come on, take it. It's all yours. Crush their bones. Take their blood. Go, win, win. This kind of thing. Kind of barbaric. But, you see, that's the kind of survival of the fittest perversion of the original line by Darwin. When survival of the fittest doesn't mean that. It was just one line from a very, very big book. You see, nature, nature is interdependent. Nature is cooperative. This whole idea of destroying opposition at all costs doesn't happen in nature. You know, nature is up and down, it's building, it's destroying, it's constantly changing. And as I say, it's interdependent. You take the biggest shark in the sea, big bad apex predator, who would be dead were it not for the little fishes who clean out its mouth, clean the wounds, take blood parasites. The fish would be dead. I'm using that as an example, but you get my point. You see, we are interdependent. And the other thing about bullying, it's kind of everywhere in our modern society. The screaming, angry headlines, screaming newscasters, crisis after crisis after crisis. This is a form of bullying. It's a form of intimidation, ultimately a form of control. Now, I'm not talking about hippy-dippy utopian, utopian idealism, because I've worked in industries where you have to be tough and you have to get stuff done. If you're on a film shoot, and the sun is going down, and you got to get the shot. By golly gosh, you're going to do whatever it takes. And you might have to be a bit impolite to do it, to get it done. But that's the deal. That's the contract. And anybody who's done projects or time-based uh, work where something has to be done by deadline, you know what I mean. So in my workshops and working with private clients, the idea of boundaries and consent is a constant thing that comes up and people like discussing this because people don't really know how maybe how to define their boundaries and define what they consent to and what they agree with and especially what they don't agree with especially where their boundaries are and where their limits are and that works on all kinds of levels knowing your limitations as dirty harry said in one of the movies and uh, i base a lot of this kind of angle of my work on the marshall rosenberg nonviolent communication model He's an American therapist who passed away a couple of years ago. And in the 1980s, he came up with nonviolent communication, which is a mediated forum for warring, arguing parties. Everything from 
uh, gangs in LA to people around the world and so forth in different parts of the world. And he spent the last 30 years of his life doing conflict resolution. And that's great. But unfortunately, if you're out in a, say, a zero hour contract job, a minimum wage, and you have some trumped up little emperor coming in, looking down their nose at you, it doesn't matter how tall they are, they'll still look down their nose at you. And you get that every day. That's kind of depressing. It's kind of depressing. Because bullying is cruel. Bullying causes suffering on all kinds of levels. Need I mention this, the recent statistics from I think England and Wales says that one in four women aged between 16 and 24 have serious psychological mental health problems. It's everything from depression, self-harm, OCD, anorexia, you name it. One in four of our young women are suffering in the head. Need I mention the uh, male suicide rate, biggest killer for men aged 20 to 34. And don't worry, among middle-aged people, both men and women, it's skyrocketing. It's very, very popular. wonder why. So what's my point? My point is that if we can learn different techniques to neutralize aggression, to upend a power play, it's better for everybody. It's almost like everyone's got a gun, except you don't need guns. You've got your words, and you've got your boundaries, and you've got your consent. You know what you're doing. Um, so, for me, the most important thing to do if you have an aggressor, a power play going on, is you run away. You get away from it, if you can. Bob Marley said, he who runs away lives to fight another day. Connor O'Hara says, he who runs away, or she, or they, who runs away, lives to run away another day. But we can't always do that, can we? We sometimes just are stuck there, and you have a person in front of you who is disrespecting you, being rude, being nasty, for the reasons I said before. Who knows why they're doing this? And it's just really horrible, isn't it? It's just not nice. Life is hard enough, and then we die. That's the other thing, bullies. Where, when you're on your deathbed, where's your power then? You have no power. You didn't never have any power. It was an illusion. It was temporary at best. And that's the important thing to say to all the trumped up little emperors. Temporary. Temporary. You'll be dead in the ground soon, just like the rest of us. <laughs> so what do you do? You stand in front of the person, and you've got to really step up. And this is for the people who are really shy, who are maybe introverted, or just are terrified of stepping into this moment. You've got to try it. You've got to try it. It's like a new jacket. And you realize, actually, this can't fit. I can do this. And I'm speaking to somebody who wasn't really ever bullied. I'm a beta male at best. You just say, excuse me, is this a power play you're doing? Maybe be a little bit sort of shy and apologetic. And you go, sorry, I, I don't really do power plays. Maybe there's another way we could communicate. Or could I get one of my colleagues to deal with you? Or can we just teleport you off this earth? <laughs> you know? Actually, I want to hear you guys say it, just for the hell of it. It's a bit of a power play, but it's benign, you know? If I count down three, two, one, you all go, is this a power play? Okay? So, three, two, one. Is this a power play? Not too bad. Let's try it again with once more with feeling, okay? <laughs> three, two, one. Is this a power play? You got it. You got it. That's great. That's a benign power play, which are allowed under the rule books that I just made up. So, um, the second one and my last point, I'll illustrate with a little story. I call it this five-second rule. The five-second rule is using silence against a bully, an aggressor, a manipulator, a power player, even an abuser, if you can, if you will. And what happened was I was going to the school where my daughter goes. And I can tell this because I don't think the person I'm talking about there is working there anymore. Um, and uh, early morning, one Monday morning, 9 a.m., drop the child off. Goodbye. Goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye. Love you. Off she goes. And I had to drop in some paperwork into the school reception. Saw the receptionist through the glass, talking with one of her colleagues, smiling, laughing. <laughs> Great. So I tapped on the window. Morning, just a piece of paper to drop in. He turned around, saw me, and instantly shut down completely. A blind person could feel it. Cold. Cold. Don't know if she's got problems with men. She probably has her own story. This is why I always recommend love and compassion. You never know where somebody's coming from. You've got to love and be compassionate, right? I mean, that's what all the wisdom says, you know? 
comes over. Yes! Almost like some kind of, you know, pantomime villain. I'm just looking at this poor person. What the hell happened to her this morning? She got out of all the wrong sides of bed. You know? And I decided, I'm not going to respond to this. I'm going to break the social contract. The social contract is, you say something, I say something, I say something, you say something. That's you know, conversation. That's a regular flow of things. I just looked at her, but not with anger. Because if you look with anger or frustration, it shows. We're intuitive, aren't we? We know these things. Whether we recognize it or not, we see all these things all the time with our eyes and third eye or whatever we want to call it. I just looked at her and smiled. A real smile. But it was kind of like a pity. Like, you poor thing. What happened to you to be so nasty? To twist like that from laughing to somebody else and then seeing me, who's done her no wrong, to be suddenly be, to be so cold. I just smiled and looked at her. One. Four, five. Of course, by three, she's doing backflips inside. Mental gymnastics. What's going on here? Why is he smiling at me like a psychotic person or something? <laughs> Which is actually pretty handy, because if you think you're a bit crazy, they're going to leave you alone. Because if you look like a victim, you'll probably be a victim. It's important. And she was like, what do you want? I'm exaggerating. I was like, what do you want? I'm here to drop this off. And again, she was a little bit rude and a little bit cold and just... Nasty, for no reason whatsoever. I'm using this minor example as a greater example where you can maybe take this kind of thing. And I smiled again, and again counted to five. One, two, three, four, five. And of course, by three, she's totally freaking out. I can see it. She's like, bloody hell, what's this guy doing, you know? I said, I'm here to drop this off. Paperwork for my daughter in this school. She took it, and then began to smile. It just actually melted a little bit. She warmed up a little bit, realizing she had some self-awareness that her behavior was not on. And that's what it is with bullies and manipulators and devious abusers. It's just not on. And it doesn't matter if it's a public or private, you can call it out. But you don't have to call it out going, shame on you, which just adds more stigma and more shame. We have enough of that. It's more of a case of what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Do you need to cry? Do you need a hug? Neighbors in home and way, they always go, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> Which is true, do you want to talk about it? And, you know, that's what therapy is, you know, that's what it's all about. So, it's funny, the next time to illustrate the five-second rule, every time I saw her after that, she was like, oh, hello, hi, really trying hard <laughs> to be nice, you know, which was actually fine. I said, okay, that's good enough, you're a bit awkward, but you're getting there. You know, stop being so cold. Life is hard, right? It's not easy. There's so many good things. And we're so privileged to live in a part of the world that we can sort of get along. We really have no excuse not to get along. Other people in parts of the world they might have you know, excuses not to get along. Or they just want to try to survive and live day to day. And you know the places I'm talking about. So finally, to wrap up, name the power play. Call it out. Just call it for what it is. Don't describe anything. Don't go, you said this, he said that. No, 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 no. no, no. Just describe it. Be detached. What are you doing? I don't do power plays. I think I'm going to count to five this time, see what happens. And you just got to try it out. Try out your own way. I'm just trying to open up a dialogue here of different ways that don't involve too much debate, too much explanation. You got to stand up, especially if you're fragile or a bit shy or feeling weak. Just try it out. Try it on for size. And it might really, really help you. So I'll finish with, finishing with quotes seems to be the thing in TED Talks. And uh, I think Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, said before, not long before he died, he said, love is wise and hatred is foolish. Foolish. Aldous Huxley on his deathbed, asked by one of his students, you know, Dr. Huxley, you've lived such a great life. You've written all these great books, Brave New World, all that. You've met so many wonderful people. What's your parting wisdom? To the world before you die. And he kind of shrugged and went, you know, I'm afraid I can only suggest just be kinder. So try to be a little bit kinder and uh, have a very good evening. Thank you for listening.